Good evening. We are about to we are about to start our discussion. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear guests, welcome to the Humanitarium. It's a pleasure to have you all here this evening with us uh, for this conference uh, entitled Is the Law of Armed Conflict in Crisis and How to Recommit to its Respect? So uh, we are very pleased to uh, welcome this evening uh, not only uh, friends from Geneva, um, colleagues from the academic sectors, but also uh, diplomats attending uh, our yearly course on uh, international humanitarian law here at the Humanitarium. We have also the pleasure of welcoming um, uh, colleagues from uh, all over the world who attend a, uh, a workshop on uh, how precisely to uh, better uh, ensure respect for international humanitarian law. And we are organizing this event uh, this evening uh, because it's uh, also um, on the occasion of our annual meeting of the editorial board of the International Review of the Red Cross. So we are very pleased to have a panel composed of our uh, board members. Uh, other board members are, are sitting with us. Uh, it's a board composed of 16 specialists from all over the world in the field of law, history, uh, different social sciences, humanitarian action. And they're here to discuss this important issue. It's based actually on the work we did at the International Review of the Red Cross. Recently, we, we published this issue called Generating Respect for the Law. Uh, and we thought it was a, a topical subject indeed, because in the past month, past years, we've observed, uh, watching the news or in the various countries where we work, gross violations of international humanitarian law, and somehow a lack of appetite, as some people put it, to further develop the law. So how can we uh, better ensure respect for international humanitarian law? How to generate respect for the law? That's the topic of this issue of the International Review of the Red Cross. It's also uh, the topic that we chose for a cycle of conferences. Uh, this event is part of this cycle, which has already had several events uh, in Geneva, in different locations. We've also organized this exhibition outside of the Humanitarium that I hope you will spend time to, to look at, uh, in order to create a, a conversation, not only here in Geneva, but in various countries, where this problem is so acute. So um, we'll discuss this evening the problem, uh, the problem uh, in modern battlefields. What is happening? Uh, why do we have this feeling that the law does not matter anymore? Uh, what are the, the crimes uh, we are um, watching? Uh, are the conflicts of today maybe less um, conducive to respect for the law? Then we will uh, uh, take some distance and we will look at the environment, uh, the international environment in which modern conflicts are taking place. And finally, our panelists will also discuss possible solutions. So um, I will now give the floor to Helen Deham, who is the Director of Law and Policy here at the ACRC, and who has been also on the board of the review for some years. Uh, and she will introduce our panel. Good evening. Well, thank you very much, Vincent, and uh, a warm welcome to everyone here tonight. We were delighted to see the range of interest in this topic. Um, as Vincent very clearly outlined, the importance of ensuring respect for international humanitarian law is deeply of importance to the ICRC. And when we see discussions happening in the wider humanitarian community and in the wider public, we always have the impulse to actually analyse a little deeper, go beyond what we hear often in the public rhetoric, which is about the extent of the problem, to move and shift it to the nature of the problem and to ask ex experts, as we have gathered here tonight, not only on the panel but also in the audience, what are some ways we can resolve, grapple with and intellectually move forward this very real issue which is about human dignity. At the end of the day, talking about systems, talking about law is all about individual people. Now we have a fine panel tonight um, and each speaker will speak for, for 10 minutes reflecting from their own perspective some of the questions as raised by Vincent and then because we've got an audience that's so rich in ideas yourself and we want to listen uh, to what you have to say we will then have a chance to have um, questions and short comments and a discussion amongst the panellists. 
Um, a number of the panellists, I probably would say that if you don't know who they are, you probably shouldn't be here tonight in relation to the role that they are playing globally on this issue. But we're going to hear first from um, Marco Sassoli, who is Professor of International Law and Director of the Department of International Law and International Organisations of the University of Geneva. So, Marco, do tell us what you think. Well, good evening um, and welcome. Um, is the law of armed conflict in crisis? Um, international law is in crisis and the international community is in crisis. Think about use ad bellum, the prohibition of the use of force between states. Um, territories are annexed, uh, countries are bombed without uh, the consent of the government. Uh, it's in crisis. International trade law, the Doha round, doesn't make any progress and more and more bilateral uh, treaties are convinced, uh, concluded. International refugee law, I don't have to tell you that unfortunately it seems that the regime simply collapses. And even what I, as a Swiss, which is, who is not in the European Union, always considered the lightening example of the rule of law among states, even European law in the refugee crisis, has, is in a serious crisis. So it's not astonishing that the law applicable to the most extreme situation, armed conflict, is perceived and probably, at least in its implementation, yes, is in a crisis. I would nevertheless say that uh, the Geneva Conventions contain the right answers, obviously not the ideal answers, but we don't get more. So we have to live with it. And situations like today in Syria, if common Article 3 to the Geneva Conventions was respected, would be totally different. And today, unfortunately, and those among you who are diplomats, you should think about it. In 1949, it was possible to conclude this treaty, including an Article 3 common which treats both states and their opponents, armed non-state actors, in the same way. Today, it will no longer be possible. Why is this so? But the law is not the best we could dream about, but fortunately we have it. As far as an implementation mechanism is concerned, states do not want an efficient implementation mechanism for international humanitarian law. Unfortunately, at the last international conference of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, a very weak and very soft mechanism, even that proposal by uh, Switzerland and the ICSC was not accepted by states. So what remains is the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, which does, in my view, an admirable work in the field. Uh, but it is a humanitarian organization, so inevitably, sorry, Helen, because she is the director of international law and policy, um, when it comes heart to heart, it gives, understandably, in my view, the priority to access and to assisting and protecting victims in the field. And this is only possible through a bilateral and confidential dialogue and with a lot of pragmatism. And therefore, the ICSC cannot possibly mobilize states and the public opinion of states, because finally states will not do anything except if their and international public opinion pushes them, because politicians in democracies want to be re-elected, and uh, if it is not an issue of internal politics where some people lobby 
And that's you, the students. For instance, you have to lobby your government that international humanitarian law is an important thing. But the ICSE cannot lead this mobilization on violations. And therefore, states uh, have an alibi not to fulfill their obligation under Article 1 common of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, they should not only respect, but also ensure respect for the conventions. One way out, I see, would be that the ICSC succeeds uh, to get acceptance of the idea that the ICSC has a dual role. It is an operational agency, and on the other hand, it is the guardian of international humanitarian law, and it has a mandate to suggest uh, improvements, including in terms of implementation mechanisms, and somehow that states understand when it comes to the treatment of detainees in a prison, the ICSE is confidential and bilateral. While when it comes to mobilizing public opinion for a better treaty, a better respect for the prohibition of weapons, as it did in the past on anti-personal landmines, on blinding laser weapons, there somehow the ICSE is an advocacy agency, and state should accept that these are the two roles and not mix the two roles. But it is, as far as I understand, increasingly difficult to get this. Um, and let us come to the violations. Now, my first point, I have only two of them, and then it's over. So my first point on violations is and this is not uncontroversial even among humanitarians. In my view, the perception of the number of violations is greater than the real situation in the field. I must say, wherever I worked in the field, and these were armed conflicts and terrible armed conflicts, I have also seen plenty of respect. While NGOs, the media, understandably, report only about violations. And so you could get the impression that IHL is nearly always violated. And this impression is fortunately wrong. But this message, including the message to say, we are in crisis, it's no longer respected, which I understand that humanitarians are shocked that out about the many violations, is a violation, is a message which undermines the willingness of respect because no one wants to be the only idiot who respects the law if all the others don't respect the law. And believe me, I would not teach this branch if I was convinced that this branch is not respected because it would be totally useless. Now, uh, in this context, I think it's also important to realize that humanitarian law doesn't promise uh, the paradise. The paradise it would be no armed conflict, and even then there are enough uh, problems in our international community. When there are armed conflicts, and even if IHL is respected, there will be plenty of people suffering. And I would appeal to all of us, not to consider every civilian killed and every destruction to be a violation of international humanitarian law. This is simply wrong. It may be that these are incidental victims of a lawful attack. I didn't make this law, but this is the law the states have accepted. And in addition, I would appeal not to especially journalists, not to consider that every violation of humanitarian law is a war crime. And I'm, I was therefore not so happy when uh, many humanitarians, including organizations I respect very much, after the destruction of the hospital in Kunduz, after destructions of hospitals in Syria, allegedly by a Russian uh, aerial attacks, after destruction of hospital by Saudi air attacks in Yemen, uh, everyone was speaking about war crime. Well, if this is a war crime, it means 
that these hospitals were deliberately attacked, as hospitals. So, and I must say, sorry that I'm naive, I don't imagine that there was a US commander or a Russian commander or a Saudi commander who woke up one morning and said, oh, today we destroy a hospital to undermine um, the health system of that country. And you understand my point. If you say it's a war crime, you say they do it deliberately. And if they do it deliberately, why should others respect international humanitarian law? Don't misunderstand me, international humanitarian law was violated because obviously you have to give a warning and you have to give the necessary time, even if, I don't know whether this was the case, the hospital was abused. And you have to take precautionary measures trying to avoid that such hospitals are affected by attacks against military uh, objectives. And my second point, again, on violations is unfortunately there is a selective perception among states and among public, in public opinion, in particular in conflict affected countries or conflict involved countries about the respect. Most are convinced that their own side perfectly respects IHL while the enemy systematically violates IHL. And this is not true. And I suggest you should, but I understand how difficult this is, try to get the message through that even the enemy cons is concerned about IHL and tries to respect IHL because otherwise, if you are really convinced that the other side doesn't care about IHL, this is another uh, phenomenon which defeats the willingness of uh, respecting international humanitarian law. Here we have also another uh, phenomenon that uh, many people are rightly so shocked by violations of use at Bellum, by aggression, by foreign occupation. And then they draw from this that necessarily those who violated the use at Bellum also violate the use in Bellum. And this, again, is not true. I think the basic message of international humanitarian law is respect the enemy. And not, like in human rights law, to empower the victims to say, I tell you what the enemy should do. It's rather to tell a party this is how you should respect the enemy, the terrorists, the aggressor, the foreign occupier, and so on. And this is a message very difficult to bring through. And I must say, I'm not absolutely sure that I'm right, but states should accept, including in my examples, credible fact-finding to convince the public opinion of their enemies that indeed they care about international humanitarian law and that sometimes uh, indeed mistakes happen or rules are violated, but we find out why they are violated. So also one hesitates when looking at the news to say that I think we should make more research about the respect of international humanitarian law. And I'm very happy to have learned that the ICC is engaged with academic partners, not me. Um, so it's not uh, self-propaganda. <laughs> uh, with academic partners, I promise, not me, uh, in uh, finding examples of respect of international humanitarian law, because I think it is important to get this message through, but we have also to deal with the violations and there we are very much dependent on states and on public opinion to push, not to push against the other side, but to push their own government to care more about international humanitarian law. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marco. There's always a fabulous combination you bring of passion 
and controversy. So thank you very much. We could have quite a robust discourse together about the always priority to access, because I can give you a few examples when we aren't always priority to access and we are very principled, but it's always great to have you here. Um, our next speaker, we're very lucky to have Adema Diang, who is the UN Secretary General's Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide. And when we were talking, I think yesterday, I gave him a lot of sympathy for the difficult task that he has, and he gave me a lot of sympathy back for the difficult task that I have. So um, I think that uh, in, in the role that is, it is held, it's really important that we hear from you your views on this topic. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, I would start by saying that uh, I agree with uh, Marco when he said that I shall doesn't promise the paradise. I do agree. I shall tend to humanize the world. But unfortunately, what we are witnessing today uh, is not really a beautiful picture. I mean, uh, I'm not someone pessimist, but I should say that perhaps never, never before the need for uh, international humanitarian law has been so great. And uh, when you see the number of conflicts around the world which has reached a record high and the sheer magnitude of human suffering is so overwhelming, uh, but at the same time, perhaps never before we have been confronted with such a lack of compliance with obligation under international law. I mean, if you uh, look today what is happening, be it in Syria, <coughs> in Yemen, in South Sudan, and I can go on and on uh, to illustrate, you will simply note that it is very unfortunate that much of the suffering is perpetrated by those with the primary obligation to respect, as you said, to respect the rules of conduct in armed conflict, especially with regard to protecting civilians and exclusively targeting uh, objects with uh, military relevance. You have uh, made reference to the uh, recent events in Kunduz, Afghanistan, uh, where civilians lost their lives in a hospital uh, was the hospital was par partially destroyed. And uh, there was call for concerted efforts to ensure that in waging or conducting armed conflict, one of our primary objective uh, should be to minimize human loss. Uh, I do agree that uh, uh, American commander will not definitely uh, send, I mean, uh, his troop to bomb deliberately an hospital. But this need, nevertheless, to be investigated, and I was very pleased when the Pentagon decided to look into that specific case. And then you have also a situation uh, like uh, the one we are witnessing today in Yemen, just to say that Kunduz is not an isolated case. In Yemen, even the ICRC, uh, condemned attacks on health facilities. In Syria, Syria and its uh, allied forces also uh, attacked sanitary facilities. And we continue to see the same similar developments in other affected countries uh, like uh, South Sudan, like if you go to uh, South Kordofan, Brunei, the Nuba Mountains in Sudan, we see the same. So something common in all of these areas uh, is that civilians are indiscriminately affected and in most cases they pay with their lives. But despite uh, this reality, uh, as the international community uh, with the responsibility to stop uh, this carnage, uh, tragic uh, loss of civilian lives and increasing number of displaced people uh, we are not short of uh, international instrument uh, to remind us of our inherent responsibility to protect civilians uh, during armed conflict and uh, non-military objects, uh, which are often critical to the provision of social services, including schools, health centers, and key government offices. 
So the Geneva Convention uh, and subsequent uh, protocols, uh, which we can say uh, form part of the uh, uh, customary international law, prohibit uh, all forms of violence uh, to life directed against any civilian. And further, international human rights law, uh, humanitarian law, uh, makes it abundantly clear that collateral damage should not be disproportionate to the concrete and military gains anticipated from an attack. So similarly, uh, international human rights law uh, provides for the minimum guarantees applicable to all individuals uh, and this includes civilians and their properties during the armed conflict. So in general, we have the necessary foundation upon which we can build and enhance our uh, commitment uh, to the protection of civilians and non-military objects. Indeed, the uh, Commission of Inquiry uh, established by the Human Rights Council uh, to investigate the events in Gaza a few years ago made it clear that states and non-state actors have an inherent obligation to respect ISL and human rights standards applicable during armed conflict. And therefore, we need political will to ensure that we live up to these commitments. Admittedly, the ever-changing nature and the composition of warring parties and the advancement in military technology uh, present its own challenges in our role uh, to effectively protect civilians and non-military objects during conflict. And while previously uh, armed conflict largely involved state militaries directly accountable to define state authorities, today, in addition to that, uh, we increasingly witness uh, groups with no state affiliation, and for some of them, with no willingness to abide by ISL in conducting armed conflict as key players in both national and international armed conflicts. We further witness how technology is increasingly assuming a center stage in the conduct of armed hostilities. For example, uh, today, it is no longer an isolated uh, scenario uh, that states uh, rely on drones and other uh, military technologies which do not uh, involve armed combatants on the ground. But despite the use of these technologies, uh, civilians uh, have not been spared. Uh, and today, warring parties take greater caution uh, to protect their armed forces personnel from harm uh, than we have seen them to do uh, for civilians. It is therefore extremely important that the technological development and capacity for precision that we witness today uh, should go hand in hand with the enhanced ability to civilian protection uh, to minimize and ultimately uh, avoid human loss wherever possible. It is important that those involved in armed conflicts, states and non-state actors alike, uh, commit themselves to respect ISL and general uh, human rights standards applicable during armed conflicts. Uh, this is one way in which we can guarantee the safety of civilians and non-military objects like hospitals and schools, which are critical to the lives of the people. Uh, the continued violation of ISL and international human rights law in Afghanistan, in Libya, uh, South Sudan, Syria, and Yemen uh, demonstrate the need for us uh, to reaffirm our fundamental belief in the role of ISL uh, to safeguard the safety and the security of those who have no direct involvement uh, in uh, armed conflict. And of further importance is the fact that accountability for crimes committed uh, should, be, should form part uh, of 
our short and long-term strategy uh, to address violation of ISIL and international human rights law uh, during armed conflict, both at the national and international level. And this is especially crucial when considering uh, that in addition to structured military command, there are also armed groups which, uh, uh, with uh, little or no defined chain of command uh, through which those who commit such violations may be held accountable. And as stated uh, recently by uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, through the Human Rights Upfront Initiative, uh, we are committed uh, to upholding the promise of never again and drawing lessons from the past failures. But in practice, it means putting human rights the protections of population and the prevention of atrocity crimes, and I mean by atrocity crimes, uh, the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crime, and ethnic cleansing, those four, uh, that category which was recognized, acknowledged by the world leaders when they met in September 2005 in New York and adopted the well-known principle of responsibility to protect R2P. So uh, I, I should say, therefore, that it is important uh, in that regard that we pay more attention to prevention. You know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, states made commitment to prevention, but they don't pay enough attention to prevention. And in that regard, I, I cannot but really uh, welcome uh, the decision which was taken in May 2012 by uh, President Obama to set up uh, a mechanism called the Atrocity Prevention Board. And I'm pleased that, and I hope that before he uh, uh, step, uh, he will be successful to get the Senate to approve a bill uh, on uh, prevention of uh, genocide. Uh, so uh, to conclude, I would say simply that the ongoing destructions of uh, objects with exclusive civilian use, including cultural heritage, uh, sites, as we have seen uh, what happened in uh, Tombuktu, what happened in Palmyra and other cities, uh, should also be condemned, and those responsible held accountable uh, in accordance with applicable international law standards. We had last November a meeting in UNESCO to look into that issue, and uh, the destruction of uh, Palmyra cultural temples by the armed groups, uh, or uh, the, the one in Tombuktu in Mali, respectively, robs humanity of priceless treasures. Uh, and I think uh, I was, like many of you here, I hope, uh, very pleased with the uh, decision which was taken by the ICC uh, to uh, investigate the case of in Tombuktu uh, against the suspected individuals involved in this heinous crime against cultural heritage in Mali. And we hope that the international community will continue to provide support to the International Criminal Court, uh, although, uh, as you may know, there is right now an attempt by uh, the Kenyan uh, administration uh, to even uh, put a motion before the Kenyan parliament uh, to uh, quit the ICC. Uh, and to my view, I think it is extremely important uh, that if there are African diplomats in this room to think really twice about that issue. Because to my view, we have to remember that uh, the ICC is not uh, uh, trying states, but individuals who are suspected of having committed serious uh, crimes, international crimes, as provided in the Rome uh, Treaty. Uh, and the last uh, word is simply to say that uh, states involved in armed conflict uh, will be expected to continue uh, taking necessary measures uh, to ensure that military targets uh, are clearly distinguished uh, against, uh, f from civilian and civilian object, uh, an issue which my colleague uh, Michael, who will be speaking, is very much familiar. And of course, full accountability will be exercised uh, 
against those who commit such violations. And uh, to conclude, my last thing is to refer simply to the unprecedented uh, event which took place uh, towards the end of last year, bringing together the UN Secretary General and the President of the ICRC standing together and making really a call uh, so that uh, the impact uh, of two days conflict uh, on civilian uh, be really uh, reduced so that we can go back to the uh, original idea, not the paradise, but to answer that wars are being humanized. And I think they were right to ask for urgent and concrete action uh, to uh, address human suffering and insecurity. And that is why, uh, following their call, I put a call myself saying it is urgent to stop uh, the erosion of the respect of IHL. Some may disagree, but I'm of the view that we are witnessing serious violations of IHL, and we need to bring that to an end. I thank you. Well, thank you very much, Adema. And it's very important for us in the ICRC to also hear from the UN voice. Um, we've got the upcoming World Humanitarian Summit where there's a lot of these discussions in a broad sense are occurring. So thank you for your reflections. Well, we've heard initially that we need to be very careful that we don't create a self-fulfilling prophecy from Marco. We've heard indeed of the legal normative framework being adequate and strong and there and that we need more political will. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, Mike Schmidt, who is the, from the US Naval War College at the University of Exeter, to see his reflections on this topic. So take it away, Mike. I, I hate to do this, but I have to do a disclaimer first because I work for the Department of Defense. Uh, the views, as you'll see in just a moment, uh, that I'll express tonight are my personal views and they do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of Defense. Helen is an old friend. Thank you for inviting me. The board members, thanks so much for inviting me back onto the board. Uh, and it's good to see old friends like Hans Peter Gasser and Francois Bugnol. So it's very nice to be back in Geneva. So I've been asked to discuss some thoughts that I've put forward with my friend Sean Watts of Creighton University in a journal called International Law Studies that we published at the Naval War College that bear pretty directly on the subject that we're dealing with today, which is, of course, you know, is the law of armed conflict in crisis? I believe, coming from the perspective of a state attorney, that it is in crisis, and I'll explain why. First, my opening premise is what you must understand is that states, and only states, make law as a matter of law. Only states have the authority to make law, and they do so in one of two ways. They either sign a treaty, they become party to a treaty, or through their practice and opinio juris, a legal term which means their expression that the practice they engage in is done as a matter of law, they're doing it because that's the law, customary law crystallizes, customary nor, uh, law uh, is formed. So only states make law, but in fact, that's the law. In fact, lawmaking and law interpretation, law application is a very pluralistic process. States play the central role. States hold all the cards. But the content and the substance, the interpretation of, of IHL, is the product of influences from many different actors. So for example, you have the judgments of military tribunals like the Nuremberg Tribunal, uh, judgments of tribunals like the ICTY, ICTR, the ICC. You have military legal doctrine, military manuals. The United States has just released its newest military manual. You have non-governmental organizations. You have the academic community. Uh, perhaps most importantly, behind states, you have the work of the ICRC. And I I believe that this pluralistic nature of IHL creation and interpretation and application is a very positive thing. And the reason it's positive is because states, by participating, will see IHL as reasonable. Because after all, they made it. But at the same time, the influence of all these other actors, like the ICRC or academics like Marco, the UN, NGOs, the influence of all these other actors ensures that states don't get out of control, that they don't get too far, they don't go too far. So 
I'm a big fan of the process. I believe states must participate, and I believe the others must participate, and this is a good thing. A good thing. Now, the challenge with IHL in particular is IHL is a very unique body of law. IHL is a delicate dance between two competing interests. The interest of states to be able to continue to fight effectively on the battlefield in order to achieve their national interests, to win, that's their national interest, and humanitarian considerations, humanitarian considerations of the international community, of their citizens, and of the states themselves, states that are committed to particular val uh, values. The problem is, all of IHL is this balance, it's this delicate balance. The problem is, is that if it gets out of imbalance, it becomes disastrous. If it goes too far in the direction of humanitarian concerns, then states are going to ignore it. They're going to say we're not bound by law that doesn't make any sense in the battlefield and stands in the way of me securing victory. On the other hand, if it goes too far in the direction of military necessity, law will not be taken seriously by anyone in the room, as my friend Marco said just a moment ago. Now, Sean and I, thinking about this, feel that the pluralistic nature is at risk. And it's at risk, the positive pluralistic nature. It's at risk because states, the ones that are the most affected by IHL, and indeed the states that are most affected, and those states are the states that go to war. It's not Switzerland, it's the United States. Those states have somehow opted out of the process, that they're sitting on the sidelines has the laws being made. And this is particularly acute with that Latin term I used, opinio juris, because states, in particular the important states, seem to have quit making expressions of opinio juris. And if they don't make expressions, if they don't offer expressions as to what they believe the law is, then they're opting out of the process of lawmaking. They're leaving it to those who informally make law, like courts or like the ICRC or like academics. As states are opting out of this process, at the same time, the other, the non-state actors in this lawmaking process, this law interpre interpretation process, wow, are they active. So you have reports by human rights NGOs and bodies uh, like losing humanity on autonomous weapons. States aren't speaking out much on autonomous weapons, but the NGO community is as autonomous weapons begin to be developed. You have individual groups of experts. Marco and I sat on a group of experts that set forth a restatement of the law of aerial warfare. There's no treaty on the law of aerial warfare, but we got together and we produced a book. And that's, what's, that's what legal advisors around the world are looking to. There's a current project I'm involved with called the Tallinn Manual, doing the same thing with regard to cyber law. All individuals acting in their private capacity. And then you have the ICRC producing lots of documents. They're in the process of producing right now commentaries to the Geneva Conventions, massive commentaries that, that will take years to produce on the Geneva Conventions. And then there are volumes of academic commentary. There's too much to read. There's so many journals, you can't possibly read it all. And one of the problems is the quality of the work varies wildly. I'll tell you, I'm not so nervous when the ICRC engages in the process because they tend to get it right. Not always. <laughs> not always. But they tend to get it right. So I'm looking very much forward to their new GC commentaries, their Geneva Convention commentaries. They've produced one. It's a magnificent product. And they're great scholars. Marco Sassoli is a friend of mine, but uh, I'm not saying this because he's a friend. He's a great scholar. When Marco writes, I read. When Hans-Peter Gasser wrote, I read everything he wrote because he's a great scholar. He's a credible source. He's making a contribution to the development of the law in a positive way. But there are lots of those out there that are not producing quality work. There are lots of people right in IHL that don't have any experience, that don't have any expertise, that don't understand the nuances of IHL, but they get published in highbrow journals because IHL is the flavor of the day. Every journal needs an IHL article. And so they'll publish trash because it's written well. I re there's an article that was circulating in the States. I mean, the academics know this. This, this bonehead wrote an article 
wrote an article that said that law professors can be targeted because they are directly participating in the hostilities by opining on the law. They're giving the enemy comfort so you can blow them up as they sit in their ivory towers. It's nonsense. This is nonsense. Or many folks don't, have, don't understand warfare. I'll give you an example. There was a, fam a very famous report in 1999 by a very prestigious, a very talented uh, human rights group that criticized the American bombing. OK. No, it's fine. OK. <laughs> that, here, I have to put my finger. It won't open up, OK? This is my, my friend Helen telling me that I've spent 8 minutes and 43 seconds talking, and I'm only through the first page. <laughs> uh, so uh, this article said, criticizes American bombing from altitude. But in fact, the reason the Americans were bombing, from, because they said that it would increase casualties. In fact, the reason the Americans were bombing is because they were using a weapon that guided on the target. And the further it traveled, the more precise it became, because it was tracking. So if you had followed the human rights uh, report's proposal to fly lower, you would have killed more people. So this is a real problem. It's, there are a lot of people active. States aren't involved. A lot of people active. And not everyone active knows what they're talking about. There is a way to solve this. The way to solve this is opinions, uh, expressions of opinion of yours. States need to say what they believe the law is, but they're not. Let me give you an example from the House. This is a very sensitive issue. It, it involves. The ICRC's interpretive guidance on direct participation hostilities, Marco and I were both part of this project, uh, uh, which became rather controversial. It doesn't really matter why it was controversial. I, I disagree with some of it. I think it's a magnificent product that's a major contribution to the understanding of IHL, but there were a few problems in it. It doesn't matter what those problems are. What matters is that states said nothing about the report. It was left to academics to criticize or to support the report. And what that means is that states have to live with the product of their silence. If you don't opine, it will catch on. And so it did. As I review ROE, rules of engagement, I see those issues with which I had a few problems reflected. Because in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So this is really problematic. It's not limited to the ICRC tribunals. We have academics like Marcus Soli, Mike Schmidt writing, and states are t or in legal advisors are turning to us, not their own country. Now, there are valid reasons for state silence. I don't want to criticize them entirely. States remain uh, ambiguity gives states greater freedom of uh, a range of options. If I remain silent, then when I engage, I can't be criticized. I like freedom of a uh, 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 range of options. It's also sometimes not always possible to anticipate the way the law is going to head, the direction, the vector of the law. So you need to be careful about expressing your view on what the law is on new things like autonomous weapons or cyber, because you may have to live with that in the future. Sometimes there's simply no clear answer. Sometimes, this happens in my country pretty frequently, recently, there's a domestic political impasse that makes it impossible for you to do so. But nevertheless, it's really unfortunate for a lot of reasons. It's unfortunate because states have great expertise that they could lend to the process. States have the resources, the money, the people to contribute to the process of law creation and information. States have access to information that others don't. I work for the Department of Defense. I have a clearance. I can read classified information. You can't. And then I'd like to close with just a thought. If states are going to opt out of the process, if they're going to opt out of the process, then what they must understand is that their failure to express their legal, reviews, legal views, for example, the failure of the United States to tell us decades later which provisions of the additional protocol reflect customary law and which do not, then that comes with great risk. And the risks are that they're surrendering the battle space to people like Helen, Marco, Adon, they're surrendering the battle space. That's OK. I like Helen. I don't mind that. But there are people out there that I do mind surrendering the battle space. And this brings me back to my final point. 
if they surrender the battle space and the law develops in a direction that they don't like, then that's going to engender disrespect on the part of states for that body of law. They made the law, not me. Why should I follow it? And to me, this represents a true crisis in the law of armed conflict. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. And um, I think you uh, took us through a journey of the delicate dance at a number of levels, not just the delicate dance that is the construct of IHL, but this delicate dance between who makes it and who doesn't. Um, things that we need to reflect on really deeply. And uh, it's good to hear, although our job is certainly not to, uh, to, uh, to please any particular state, but it's good to hear from individuals about the, uh, the quality of the work. I think we really need to make sure that we let lawyers be lawyers and uh, engage in the important construction of things going forward. And we may always agree to disagree on certain topics. So thank you, Mike, for that. Um, our final speaker tonight is Fiona Terry, and she uh, is an independent researcher, but she is working uh, with and in, within the ICRC, and she will have a certainly different take on this issue that we're grappling with in relation to whether or not the law of armed conflict is in crisis, and more importantly, what can we do about that? Thanks, Fiona. Thank you, Helen. I love the way they leave the solutions to the non-lawyer on the uh, panel. <laughs> it's very kind of you. <laughs> so um, what I'm working on with the ICRC is going to um, shape a little bit what I'm going to say to you tonight and the fact that I also have been a practitioner over the last uh, 25 years in the field. So I'm really not talking um, from the, at this, about this issue from the perspective of, of my fellow panellists. In fact, I'm working on the update to the Roots of Behaviour in War study that the ICRC first launched in, in, well, published in 2004. And so I think it's really important when we talk about the atrocities that we're seeing in the, in the world today, which of course bring out very strong emotions in us all, but we really need to situate these within their historical context. And, you know, this has been my bedside reading for the last few months, the barbarization of warfare. And let me tell you, the atrocities in here from the Second World War, from Vietnam, from, from all over, we do tend to forget. And I think it's very important to put this in historical perspective. And I think it's also important to reiterate what, what Marco has said, that perception plays a very important role in this. And I think there is so much more awareness today um, of of the atrocities that are, are going on from, from two factors in a way, just like this CNN factor in the early 90s tended to make us so much more aware of human suffering around the world and you know there was the pull factor of CNN we all, all talked about. Well today we have social media which is playing a very important role for good and for bad. People are much more aware of what's happening but also some of these groups like Daesh, like uh, Al-Shabaab are using this as recruitment tools. They're using these images of horror um, in a ways to both terrorize and people get people on board. And so um, it's important to remember that. And also I think that people are so much more aware today that these are crimes and they're heinous crimes and we shouldn't allow them to happen and not just by groups like um, Daesh and Al-Shabaab but also by um, our own troops of the different countries um, uh, participating in, in conflicts around the world. I'd like to remind you all that in 1968, because this really hit me, I got this detail out of this book, that um, in, we all know about the Milai massacre where uh, hundreds and hundreds of civilians were massacred. And when Lieutenant William Cayley was actually prosecuted for, or was actually arrested um, uh, for these crimes, um, at the time, President Nixon, within 24 hours of his arrest, was sent over 100,000 telegrams and letters, 99% of which denounced this arrest, 99% of which said, no, but this is what happens in war, this is acceptable, you know, you cannot prosecute him. And in the end, he spent very little time uh, being prosecuted for, for those crimes. Now, these this 100,000 were not tweets which is very easy to do today. These were not Facebook, you know, outrage, uh, je suis, uh, you know, me lie or whatever else. These were letters and telegrams that people really had to put effort into sending. So I really think it's really important to not 
despair of international humanitarian law as the non-lawyer <laughs> and to say that actually so much of this outrage and this, um, and this uh, attention to these issues is because we all think that these things are so terrible. So I'm a little bit less um, pessimistic. But having said that, of course, and being a practitioner on the ground, there are some very real issues that we are dealing with which we need to take very seriously. And I'm so glad that people have been bringing up the bombing of hospitals as being one of them. I worked a long time for Médecins Sans Frontières, and I think it's very, uh, it's, it's just so shocking to see um, that in the month of October alone, there were three attacks on hospitals in Syria, in uh, Afghanistan, and in Yemen. And, uh, and this is a, a really tragic state of affairs, which, is, which has very uh, severe consequences beyond IHL, well, in terms of um, being able to deliver aid uh, in these places, because if you kill all the doctors and you don't, uh, and uh, aid workers are at huge risk of being bombed or kidnapped, well then of course the aid can't get to the people most in need of it. And this is what we are seeing, not just from the bombings, but also from the criminalisation of aid, not a, you know forbidding aid organisations to talk with groups that are designated as terrorist groups. And so this is a, a, a very big problem. Um, interestingly today, I, I found that uh, I thought that people were going to blame most of the atrocities on non-state armed groups and was going to say that um, we need to unpack this, this notion of a non-state armed group a little bit more. But I want to draw to attention to the fact that states who are the people behind the development of IHL um, are committing many of these atrocities themselves. And we shouldn't remember that because it's very easy to blame um, non-state armed groups, even though my colleagues did not do that tonight. But um, so we do see major um, problems, as I say, in the, in the field. And one of the cases which for me is very um, uh, personally distressing is to see what's happening in South Sudan, because I think you really can make a case for the fact that the violations that have been committed in South Sudan since 2013 are worse than anything we've seen in the 23 years that was the civil war between well, the South and, uh, and the North. And of particular interest here is that I did a study for the ICRC on Sudan and to know that for 30 years the ICRC had been talking about international humanitarian law and respect for civilians and respect for hospitals and that um, this is, and, and the players have not really changed that much in South Sudan. And so, you know, this leads to the question, why has this failed? So that's why, what's one of the reasons why, um, the ICRC is very interested in renewing this study of the Roots of Behaviour in War. Because when the Roots of Behaviour 1 study was published in 2004, it had major policy change, it led to major policy changes within the ICRC. Up until that time, ICRC had focused very much on spreading knowledge of the law. But after the study was done and it looked at you know, who was committing at the individual level, the psychosocial processes, the authority structures. Um, the ICRC decided to change its approach. And instead of just simply talking about the law and spreading knowledge of it, but actually felt that it would be much better to incorporate law into the doctrine of an armed force or an armed group, a state armed force or an armed group, because there are also codes of conduct, which are a, a form of doctrine, um, to try to encourage um, the integration of this doctrine into the training of armed forces in the respect for the laws of war, and then also into sanction mechanisms, really encouraging states and non-state armed groups to think about punishing um, atrocities, otherwise these um, laws would not be uh, effective. And so that was really the policy that the ICRC has pursued over the last 10 years. But even at the time of the launch in 2004 of the study, a member of the Assembly, who we all know, Yves Sandos, brought up the fact that, well, this is very interesting, but such an approach presupposes a hierarchical structure, a vertical structure in an armed group. Whereas at the time in 2004, we were already seeing the emergence of groups that did not have this hierarchical structure. So he raised the question even back then, um, how are we going to influence uh, respect for humanitarian law in amongst these sorts of groups? Now, in the 10 years that has gone by since, uh, or 12 years now, um, since the Roots of Behaviour in War had, was, uh, was published, we have seen the emergence of far more of these types of groups. When you look at Libya, when you look at, um, I mean, my colleague uh, Brian's uh, study on Libya found that there were 236 armed groups registered in Misrata alone at the end of the Libyan uh, conflict. And that was just in one city. So we're seeing really the emergence of, of these groups that are not 
um, linked necessarily under a hierarchical structure, but emerge more and form these loose alliances among themselves. And we don't really understand very much about them, but we certainly know that the idea of trying to you know, put forward a doctrine and training and have this um, um, trickle-down effect of law is, is really not going to necessarily be very effective on these groups. And I think in Syria today, we see thousands of these types of groups. So how can we try to, you know, what should we do from here? So that's what we have embarked upon um, with um, the idea of being twofold. Because we also want to know what is it in uh, about the way that we have approached these vertical groups that has been more effective? Is it in fact the doctrine, the ideology of a group that is more effective in influencing the behavior of troops on the ground? Is it the training or is it the sanction mechanisms, the threat of punishment, the ICC, etc., or just threat of... Uh... Um, so we want to investigate that in our study. Plus we want to investigate um, how, how, do the, how do norms of restraint form within um, these more horizontally organized groups. And so we've decided to look at four different typologies of groups. So one is state armed forces, and one is armed groups with a, a strong ideology. And then one is groups with community links, much more horizontal. And one is groups with an Islamist ideology, but who are more the loosely um, connected groups. And, we've just, and in the last 10 years, there's been quite a lot of attention given to the question of why do different armed groups commit violations? So there have been a lot of theories and a lot of, uh, a lot of empirical studies, which is really great to see, who have gone out and interviewed people and done great surveys in the field to try to understand why do armed groups um, commit atrocities. And a lot of different theories have come out that, which are, you know, which I think a lot of them really uh, make sense to humanitarian practitioners on the ground who have seen this sort of thing happening that, you know, the minute a group is controlling territory and wants legitimacy, it tends to behave better towards the civilian population. That groups that rely on the extraction of natural resources and don't need the local population to sustain their rebellion tend to treat the population much more violently. And so all these studies are very interesting for us and very useful. But what we uh, would like to do is to turn the question on its head and to look at what is it that actually restrains certain armed groups from committing violations. And this is following the work of Elizabeth Jean Wood, who recently spoke in The Humanitarian, I think by, um, by video link from, uh, from the States, and also another academic uh, named Scott Strauss, who have done some very interesting studies, uh, Elizabeth Wood on, on sexual violence, looking into why is it that the LTTT in Sri Lanka did not engage in widespread sexual violence, whereas other groups have. What were the norms of restraint that held them back from doing that. And then um, Scott's work has looked at Rwanda and the genocide, and he's looked at all the factors that contributed to the genocide, and then looked at the Cote d'Ivoire and said, why did a genocide not happen in the Cote d'Ivoire when many of the factors were the same? It could have gone either way. So I think because we want a policy focus to our study, this has been a really interesting approach to say, what is it? that is influencing these groups not to commit certain atrocities. And so that's what we are going to be focusing on. And the other part of our focus is uh, the Roots of Behaviour 1 study was looking very much at the psychosocial individual level. Uh, we are looking much more at the group level because this gives a comparability for us to look at the norms of restraint and how they are formed at the peer group level. We will be looking at the um, importance of the organisation, of outside influences, but our main focus will be on, on the group because this seems to be where a lot, as we know from state armed forces, there's been so much work done on military cohesion. We know that the peer group pressure is very, very important. So the, how, does it, how does it play out? Who are influencing these development of norms and what is it that's important? With the hope that our study might advance our knowledge just a little bit, I'm certainly not saying that it's going to help us understand exactly how to make these groups recommit to a respect for international humanitarian law, but I think we really need to start looking more at what sources of influence are playing on these groups and how can we and other humanitarian organisations tap into that and have better influence with these groups to try to help them, uh, or to try to make them respect um, uh, the, the norms uh, of, of IHL in a better way.
Well, thank you, Fiona. And yes, it is a little tough to leave uh, the solutions. So I think everyone's come up along along the way with solutions. But I think this addition to, as well as the clear, certainly from an ICRC perspective, clear analysis and going forward in a legal paradigm, which is critical, the way to ensure that we also look at how we can challenge our own policy work and the way we attempt to influence and use the law both as a tool to influence, but also understand, as Fiona talked about, the structures of those we wanting to influence. So we've had a smorgasbord of views. We've had a range of, I would say, proposals coming up from the need to, um, as our first speaker said, Marco, profile the positive examples when IHL actually does work for confidence building. We've heard of the need to strengthen the political will to apply the existing normative framework. We've heard a very interesting discourse about the need for there to be further and deeper reflections of the implications if states opt out and what that actually means for the system. And then finally, as, as we heard, the issues of how we can influence those who are weapons bearers around norms of restraints. So that gives us a lot of information to go forward in, but what I wanted to do for the next 20 minutes is to provide it open to you as the audience. If you are going to say a statement, please make it short. We've got a lot in the audience and we'd like to finish on time. But Make the most of the diversity of views at the table here to ask questions or perhaps make a short, short comment on some of your own views. I understand we have roving microphones and um, it would, uh, I now open it up for short comments or questions from the audience. The gentleman here to start with. I might take three questions at a time and uh, then we will um, go back to uh, the panel. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the panelists for a very interesting presentation. My name is Maher Markarian, I'm from the Mission of Armenia to UN. Um, uh, the question goes probably to Fiona Terry and Professor Sassoli. Uh, during the recent escalation of violence in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict zone, when so-called kamikaze drones were used first time, and atrocities such as beheadings and mutilation of bodies were committed by one party, the ICRC was quick to react and has arranged for the exchange of dead bodies between the parties. While understanding the limitation that the ICRC has, and those were also highlighted by Professor Sassoli, in terms of naming and condemning the, those who are responsible for barbaric acts, don't you think that in order to uphold the international humanitarian law and the Geneva Conventions in particular, there needs to be an ambiguous identification and condemnation of the violating party. And as a follow-up question, do you see a role for the ICRC in reporting at least the registered facts on the ground to the attention of the international community and relevant institutions, be it the Office of Human Rights Commissioner or others? Thank you. Thank you. A question from this side? I'll be geographically balanced. No? Oh, yes. Um, um, Ibrahim Mulabi, uh, I run an organization called the Syrian Legal Development Program, which engages with armed and non-armed actors in Syria on promotion of IHL. My question goes to the, any of the panelists who would like to take it. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have colleagues in other legal regimes, and don't you see a, a relationship between a crisis in IHL and crises in other legal regimes as a result of that, mainly international criminal law, which talks about accountability for such violations, and then how a crisis in international criminal law would lead to more violations in IHL because there's no accountability, there's no any kind of enforcement mechanism, and it's a, a, a spiral that would go on and on. So is there a need for a discussion to look beyond just a crisis in one regime and uh, look at the cross-cutting issues between a variety of legal regimes? Thank you. And one final question. Um, I think the gentleman up there. Thank you very much. First, uh, I would like to congratulate the panelists for their uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation. I'm uh, Omar from Afghanistan Mission, but I think here is more uh, that uh, we are presenting as a global citizens, not as a diplomat that representing our countries. I would ju just like to uh, 
comment very shortly some issues and also some questions. Well, I do agree with the, with the first panelist when he was saying uh, that uh, the media and NGOs, uh, normally they are showing the bad news. I do agree with this. There has been a lot of developments here, there, around the world. But at the end of the day, that is the reality. That some point of the world, people has been killed. And these people, most of them are civilians. And another comment I want to raise is that in human history, everyone knows, I, I, I believe that the, everyone agrees with me, fighting conflicts, battles, killing human, human, each other is not something new. But what I believe is new after 1945 is the sides are not clear. Who is fighting who? We just discussed before in other session, which I heard from a, a specialist or a researcher of uh, law, international law, or, I mean, humanitarian international law, that she was saying that Afghanistan case is a national conflict. Well, she's saying her own idea or based on research or, uh, and, and she gave me as professional what, why it's a con, an international law. But as a citizens, if we go to make three portion of the 30 wars of Afghanistan, and you, if you see the, 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 the reality and the source of conflict, it's not an Afghan war. And it's the same with other countries. What a Syrian called this war for himself is a Syrian pure problem and it is the cause of war there or it's the international player. And there has been casualties. Who's responsible for this? Is it Syrians? Or is it international players? I don't think that we give a clear messages. While I, 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 while there are a lot of uh, conferences, meetings are going on, and even here I hear very interesting uh, presentations. But I hope in one sentences, each panelist give one solution for what will be the solution for situation going on. Maybe each one, if they could say one sentence, I mean, starting from first to the fourth panelist, and saying this is the solution for current situation. And I think that would be very clear for everyone. At the end of the day, when we go out, we at least have four sentences that is positive and saying that this way will this problem end. And also another thing, if you see the creation of United Nations, it has been created to prevent wars. But I'm not I don't want to criticize what the United Nations is doing because at the end of the day, we are the one who created the United Nations. And, and at the end of the day, we are responsible. When you discuss the United Nations, they say it's states who takes the decision. But look at what is going on. Yesterday, there has been 200 people wounded in Kabul, and I think 50 were killed. And it was the only a condolence letter coming out from the Ban Ki-moon, and he condemned this attack. And what is next after this condemn? And how long will it take? Is it just will continue in the future, 30 more years that there is an attack, and after the day is a condemned letter? And <laughs> I, I, my, this question will go to the colleagues from UN. Just very briefly, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. 
Um, so we have a number of questions for the panel to look at. The first one relates to the modality of the ICRC, um, and I think that was directed to particular people on the panel. I myself would like to answer it, but I'm going to restrain and let it to go to others. But it really comes to the heart of what is it that ICRC does in this space. We've also got the interesting issue raised um, about the spillover effect, so to speak, if one area of international law is perhaps having um, having issues or, or being uh, struggles, does that have an impact on the wider, particularly the interface between IHS and international criminal law. And if uh, the final question there was a, a big ask. I mean, I think what we're dealing with today is awkwardly large problems that have awkwardly large solutions if they're going to work. But what I would ask for the panel um, to say one sentence each in, of, in general, what, what is, and I think they've embedded it in each of their speeches, but what do they think in one sentence would assist to make situations, whether it be Afghanistan or, or globally, have better respect for IHL. So I'll throw it open to the panel now on the first question about the modalities of the ICRC, our important role in, uh, in uh, working through our principles and our, our neutrality, but also I think it was raised by Marco in relation to some of the limitations that, that intrinsically are a part of the way we work. Shall I give my elements to the three question, or first we deal with the first question? Okay. Well, there, as I told you, the ICSC doesn't do it, and perhaps even your country is happy that the ICSC doesn't do it, because imagine it was uh, condemning your country when your country commits violations. So uh, the ICSC, to keep the access and to have a dialogue, uh, uh, it doesn't do that, but uh, there are other bodies. For instance, there is an International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission which exists since 20 years and never any state has want wanted to ask it to inquire into violations of humanitarian law, also because states are like Sicilian, I'm half from Italy, Sicilian mafiosi. There is omerta, states don't want to have an inquiry because they fear, as an impartial inquiry must result in finding not only violations by one side, but also by another side. Thank you, Marco. Perhaps we'll uh, move on to the next, the second question and, and take it from um, other panellists and come back to Marco in relation to the, this idea about how, almost not the domino effect of international law questions, but how they interrelate to each other. So I actually do think there is a relationship between bodies of law that lead to disrespect. If you take the topic I was talking about, which is states disengaging from the process and therefore they don't have ownership of the law and therefore inevitably they will lose respect for the law because they don't see it as their law, I think it's clearly the influence of human rights law on armed conflict. For better or worse, right or wrong, the uh, the activity of the human rights law community in armed conflict has caused states significant concern about all law on the battlefield. Now, I don't think that bleed over is fair, but I work with the military on a daily basis, and they watch the European Court of Human Rights opining on conflict situations, and it just makes them nervous about law generally. And this, in my mind, is a very dangerous thing. I would simply add to that we have been uh, really uh, witnessing, I would say, a strong uh, influence, uh, vice versa, between uh, the international criminal law, international humanitarian law, through the jurisprudence of the ad hoc tribunals, ICTY, ICTR, there's no doubt. But I think uh, if we, one really would like, as you said, I mean, making reference to the case of Syria, there is no doubt that uh, we have been failing uh, as international community uh, to bring the perpetrators of the serious crime to account for those crimes. I mean, uh, as you may know, uh, uh, Switzerland took the initiative and followed by at least near 70 states to uh, ask the Security Council uh, to refer the case of uh, Syria to the ICC, but it didn't fly. So, uh, which means that uh, unless we 
do better uh, at holding perpetrators of uh, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes to, to, to justice, uh, I, I think we will have certainly a long way still to go. Uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, those who have power sitting in the Security Council uh, should certainly uh, think twice. And uh, there is right now, as you may know, uh, an initiative uh, of, uh, which has been signed by 110 member states at the General Assembly uh, to call uh, definitely on those in the Security Council to have some kind of a code of conduct, meaning that whenever there is a situation where uh, population are facing the risk of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crime, ethnic cleansing, that none of those who have the veto use that veto to enable the protection of those populations who are at risk. Well, thank you. Um, what I might do is actually skip the, that final question and have that at the very end, because that gives my panellists more time to think of their one snappy sentence of the answer to a deep, deep problem, um, but also allows us maybe to take two more questions uh, before we conclude. So I've got one gentleman here and uh, I think a lady over there. Thank you very much. Um, from uh, Permanent Mission of Egypt, I will try to make my question as quick as possible to the distinguished panelists. Do you think uh, there are any possible ways to convince, or I would say oblige, nine state actors to abide by international uh, humanitarian law other than uh, the sanctions way or the international criminal prosecution? Thank you. Thank you for that sharp question. And uh, the, the lady there, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Marine Bissonnier with MSF. Uh, fascinating to hear, Fiona, uh, about uh, your work and how you will be looking at how the norms of restraints form for non-state actors. But as you've reminded us and others on the panel, uh, in most recent attacks uh, that we've seen, states have been directly implicated. Uh, you know, four out of five of the P5 of the Security Council have been associated with coalitions uh, that have uh, been directly uh, uh, um, uh, associated with uh, attacks against medical facilities in Yemen, Syria, and Afghanistan. Um, in a few weeks, we're going to see some discussion at the UN Security Council itself for a reaffirmation of the medical mission, which I think we can only all welcome. But yet, what does it even mean in a context where those very states are the ones that have been implicated? And I wonder here if we could hear from the uh, people on the panel uh, how they're thinking about these questions and reinforcing the norms for states themselves as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, two nicely balanced questions to conclude. One on above and beyond sanctions. How do we engage with non-state armed groups in this space? And the other in relation to states. Um, so I'll throw it open to the panellists. Maybe I'll start with Marco and work, work down. Uh, thank you. So on uh, non armed non-state actors, yes, I'm convinced they can be engaged and there is a possibility just... Armed non-state actors are made up of human beings like states. And you have to discuss with them, and you have to listen to them, to understand their problems, and to try to get their engagement. And there are such procedures. For instance, an NGO in Geneva, Geneva Call, uh, takes up uh, engagement commitments by non-state actors. And once they have committed, then to continue to have on their dialogue, to monitor their respect, to understand their problems, to respect, to advise them. But unfortunately, many states criminalize any such engagement of armed non-state actors. And obviously, if you isolate them and you criminalize them only, then this is a self-fulfilling prophecy because then these non-state actors will precisely behave as criminals because they are completely outside the system. While, as with all belligerents, if you try to uh, engage them and to discuss with them and to convince them that it is also in their interest because many, not all, 
of these non-state actors are fighting to become the government, to become an independent state, and do they want to have a country in ruins, or do they want to have a country where people can live? I think such arguments are possible, and with many such actors, it is possible. And the UN Secretary General has written, so it's not me, he has written that it is true that you cannot, you will not be successful with all state and non-state actors, but at least you have to try, because if we do not even try, we will certainly not obtain respect. And member states, that's again the UN Secretary General who wrote it, member states should encourage that instead of criminalizing it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and maybe if you wish to answer either yes. question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would simply say that nobody is born terrorist. One is made terrorist. I mean, I can say, for instance, that uh, the, the, the Yusuf, who was uh, the founder of what became later Boko Haram, was not a terrorist. And uh, therefore, it is extremely important that we do engage, I think, uh, if necessary, dialogue. I, I think what we need is to understand better the dynamics of emerging uh, non-state uh, armed groups and uh, in some cases, how to enter into dialogue uh, with them. Uh, you refer it to the uh, wonderful work uh, which is being achieved by Geneva Call, bringing non-state armed group to sign commitment to uphold principles of Aisha, that is extremely important. But on the other hand, uh, such dialogue could help also to encourage respect for the, the, the same principle. And when that is not possible, at least how to prevent uh, the spread of extreme, uh, violent extremism. And I think in that regard, we should have the courage uh, to really uh, acknowledge that we are being confronted with new challenges. I mean, this type of uh, conflict uh, is today new, and we have to look into many other related aspects for the first time last December, the Security Council adopted a resolution on the financing of uh, terrorism, which means that uh, definitely if ISIL is so well equipped today, it's certainly because there are people behind who provided resources, who provided equipment, etc. And I think this could apply also to other non-state armed groups. Uh, my office has just concluded uh, two weeks ago a meeting of experts in Brussels uh, in uh, cooperation with the External Action Service of the European Commission. My good friend Elizabeth, the president of Geneva Call, made an extremely important contribution in that meeting, as well as one of the experts of the ICRC. We have to realize that this is a new challenge we are facing. But at the end of the day, what we need is to build uh, strong, cohesive societies uh, that could really with, I would say, periods uh, and resist attempts to manipulate identity to commit crimes, and particularly in the context of conflict. We need to get member states, to get every and each government to manage diversity in the most constructive manner. Because when people are being excluded uh, like was the case in Iraq during the uh, time of uh, both Saddam and who succeeded him, the Prime Minister al-Maliki, we saw the result which today we are all being confronted with. Thank you. Mike? So I'll only answer the non-state question because I'll address the state question in the final round. Um, Boy, thank you for that easy question. It's pretty easy to get non-state actors to comply with the law. And of course, I'm being facetious. I'll give you only an answer from a military perspective. If you're engaged in a counterinsurgency against a non-state actor, what you want to do is starve the, uh, the non-state actor of its oxygen. Its oxygen is the operating environment in, in, in which it is, and that's among the population in most cases. And in many cases, that's external support. Of course, I, this doesn't apply to every group, but many non-state groups. And one of the ways you deprive them of that oxygen they require is by using the law against them, using the law in a, in a positive sense. This is known in our business as lawfare. In other words, you shine the light of, uh, on them whenever they violate the law, and you rigidly adhere to the law yourself. 
This requires you to do things that you're not used to doing and that make you very uncomfortable. Uh, the most, one of the most important is you must open the door to human rights groups, to the IHL community, to the ICRC. You must make reports public so long as they don't um, uh, endanger your military operations, make them public, cooperate with people. Uh, and this, at the end of the day, this is going to turn the population against them. If you do this effectively, it'll turn the international community against them. They'll die of oxygen deficit. But I hasten to add, this only works with some types of non-state groups. I don't know what you would do with an ISIS, for example. Thanks. And Fiona, maybe just briefly on the state issue that was raised. Well, I also want to address the non-state. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. But people want their dinner. Well, no, I think one of the very interesting things we've, that I've discovered in the research that it, uh, I've been doing that other, uh, other people are probably very aware of, but that, um, that punishment actually is something that we really need to question, the threat of punishment. I mean, one study I was reading on the, on the RUF, who had... Um, 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 Fodi Sankor had a very uh, harsh punishment against committing rape, in, including executions. And yet, once he was arrested and uh, in Nigeria, there was this uh, huge spate of rape carried out by, by the RUF. So, you know, the threat of punishment is, is interesting. And also, um, for the state side, um, one of the researchers we're going to have working on our, our, um, our project has been studying the, the US state military, and he's been studying norms of restraint, and he's been looking at different forms of training in the US military, and then he's been correlating what uh, the people who've done this training have gone out to be platoon uh, commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he's been looking at the uh, uh, violations of IHL that have been committed. And he's made a very st um, solidly statistical analysis between the intensity of training and the reduction in the number of IHL violations, which is, of course, a very, very interesting finding. And he actually says that, of course, across the US military, the threat of punishment is exactly the same. But we see this big correlation. So I think we really need to rethink this. What is the role of punishment versus other aspects, versus the ideology, the doctrine, and the types of training going on? So that's what we will be looking at within the military and these ideological groups. Um, and I definitely think with non-state armed groups, there are, uh, are definitely ways of influencing them. I agree with, uh, with some of the groups, ISIS, etc. It's going to be far more challenging. But we definitely saw in Afghanistan there was a major change in the way that the, uh, the Taliban, um, instead of attacking uh, health care centres at some state, stage in the war about 2008, 2009, decided that actually needed the population on side. I think when a, when a group is, is, is wanting to have legitimacy, is wanting to, to win the hearts and minds of the population themselves, then you'll see a huge reduction in, uh, in violations and abuses. So I also think that the work of Geneva Call and others and the ICRC's work in talking about codes of conduct and encouraging and having dialogue with these um, non-state armed groups is absolutely crucial. And that's been a big problem with the criminalization of, uh, of certain groups. Great. Well, we're out of time. Um, apologies for going a little bit late. ICRC doesn't have the answers, but what we wish to do and we will always do is open up spaces for conversations, conversations where we can engage and learn from each other. So thank you for tonight, even if you didn't ask a question or, or engage, but thank you for being part of a conversation that is really necessary at the moment, and we will continue to do that. But I will pass it over to panellists for their one sentence, and I'll be quite strict, it's not a paragraphy sentence. It's the one sentence just for people to have a think about some of the things productively we can do going forward. Start to think about respecting your enemy and not thinking about the violations of your enemy and of the others and of everywhere in the world. I would simply say that we must generate a greater sense of responsibility for obligation under international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Mine is a practical suggestion. You need to professionalize your military so that they understand that when you violate IHL, that has military cost, and you need to ensure that military is highly disciplined so that the commanders can control their troops in the field. 
Um, and from my part, we need to understand much better, you know, why these atrocities occur, why violations occur, and what um, is holding different groups back, why would they also respect IHL? So a much better understanding. And on that note, I had forgotten to mention that this time next week, we are actually hosting all of our researchers that are going to do this field research that I've been talking about on the norms of restraint. In fact, we came out with a name for it today, which is the roots of restraint. So there you go, you have the scoop, that's the name of the study now. And uh, they'll all be here next week. So I really invite you all to come and uh, pose questions to them about their prior research, because I think we can go really quite far. All of the researchers we've taken on have had have strong contacts with different armed groups. They've conducted really interesting research. So, um, so please join us next week. We've had four sentences, an advertisement, <laughs> a night of interesting discussions. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you at the next time we start such conversations. Next week. Next week. Yes, and please join us for the cocktail reception upstairs at the ICRC restaurant. <laughs>